Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming and attending this momentous event. Uh, my name is Professor Nina Ha, and I'm the director of the World Literature Program here at Creighton. Um, this year, for the World Literature II courses, students were assigned the novel, The Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia, by Ma Professor Mary Helen Stefaniak. Um, the theme for World Literature One and II um, for this academic year was Literature Within Literature, and Professor Stefaniak's book reflects this theme very well. Um, in addition, this is the first time that a novel by a Creighton professor was chosen to be read by the World Literature Program. So it is indeed a momentous occasion. Um, before the introduction to Professor Stefaniak, I would like to thank a few people who assisted me with putting this event together. Um, the first and foremost is the Dean of Arts and Sciences, Dean Leeger, whose office supports the World Literature Program. In addition, I would like to thank the office manager of the English department, Ms. Jackie Mas Masker, whose support has been invaluable. Next, I would like to thank my colleagues in the English department, as well as the members of the World Literature Committee, who have been so wonderful with their commitment to this program. Finally, thank you to all the instructors who teach th these World Literature courses. Now, please welcome Dr. Brent Spencer, who has, was gracious and kind enough to agree to introduce Professor Mary Helen Stefaniak. Thanks, Nina. Nina deserves a lot of thanks, too, for running this program so well. So uh, I speak for many. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, yes. <laughs> um, I'm Brent Spencer, the director of creative writing and a teacher of World Lit. So I'm, uh, on many counts, very happy to be here. And I just want to say a few words before our guest uh, steps up here. Um, maybe in a way to introduce her, yes, of course, but uh, also to explain, I think, something that, uh, you know, you may ask yourself, if you're in world lit, as many of you are, why you have to read literature. And I thought, this is a great occasion to explain that to people. I'll tell you, because it's a secret that not many people know, though it's one you probably know deep down in your bones, not in your conscious mind. You know the answer, though. Uh, you have to read literature because teachers love torture. They, uh, they just love to put you through the challenges that are posed by uh, this literature. Okay, I'm kidding, kind of, sort of. But um, actually, there's another reason to that question, a real answer to why we lead, read literature, and it is that we read it in order to understand others. Great literature embodies characters, behaviors, and events that echo actual people actual behavior and actual events in the world around us. We understand the real people in our world better when we understand the imaginary people in novels and stories and plays and poems and essays and movies and so much more. You might argue that you already have a full set of family, friends, and associates, and you already understand them just fine. And besides, you don't have room for any other people in your life. So just leave me alone, right? But I'd have to answer that no, we don't really understand the people we're closest to. You know I'm right. You know if you're from a family that's been blindsided by divorce. You know I'm right if you've ever, had, ever been dumped by a girlfriend or boyfriend. You know I'm right if you've ever been betrayed by someone you thought was your best friend. If you've ever done something you're ashamed of, you know we don't even know ourselves very well. So maybe you agree with me now, you can never really understand another person, no matter how close they are to you. But maybe you're so busy trying to understand those people that you just don't think you can make room in your life for anyone else. For people from ancient Rome, medieval Japan, Renaissance England, 19th century France, the kinds of people you meet and the places you read about in world lit. I mean, what have those people got to do with you, right? Well, here's what they have to do with you, I think. The world has always been a very complicated place, and it's getting more and more complicated by the second. Look at 9-11, at Iraq, at Afghanistan, Japan, Egypt, Yemen, Libya, Ivory Coast. Look at the mortgage crisis, the unemployment rate. You don't think these things have anything to do with you? 
Maybe you think you can sit back in splendid, untouched isolation and pretend that nothing that happens halfway around the world has anything to do with you. But you'd be wrong. It has everything to do with you. Everything. Soon the candy bar you buy will cost more because of what's happening right now, today, in Ivory Coast. And ask the parent in California who's pouring radiated milk in her child's cereal bowl if what's happened around the world has anything to do with her. The human enterprise is a vast network of connections that spans many thousands of years and many hundreds of thousands of miles. And like a spider's web, you touch one small strand and the entire thing trembles. Or let me put it another way. You read world literature because, as the old song says, you are the world. You are Achilles storming the walls of Troy. You are Sei Shonagan writing down all the gossip and court intrigues in the pillow book. You are Emma Bovary, your life choices shrinking step by tragic step. You are Don Quixote dreaming a world that no one but you seems to be able to see. And because you can imagine your way into those lives, those imaginary lives, you can more easily imagine your way into real lives. You are the office worker staring out a window of the World Trade Center, unable to believe your eyes. You are the American soldier trudging through the desert outside Baghdad. And at the same time, you are the Iraqi parent clutching your child as the bombs fall and fall. You are the world. The world is you. And so we come to Mary Helen Stefaniak's novel, The Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia. So OK, you might say, I see why I need to read Gilgamesh and Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. But why this book? Well, I'll tell you. I could, by the way, tell you all about Professor Stefaniak's many other publications and her boatload of awards and honors. I'm not going to do that. It would take all night. Uh, I could quote the praise from critics and readers all across the country. No, it takes too much time. So I want to put this more simply. The Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia, is a story about transformation, about change. It's about a gifted and inspiring teacher who comes to a small town in Georgia and changes the lives of everyone she meets. She opens eyes and minds. She helps her young students, and the whole town, in fact, see that there is a world beyond their own backyards, and that that world has everything to do with who they are, in many cases, quite directly with who they are. It isn't easy. She comes up against the forces of hatred and intolerance, but there is no quit in her. She won't back down. And by the end, she has changed those lives forever and for the good. She has brought those people into the wider world, into full awareness of what it means to be part of the human enterprise. And that's what we learn in courses like English 120 and 121, to be fully engaged human beings, fully engaged with the business of living, World Lit is the intellectual equivalent of Google Earth, when you think about it. It brings the whole world from the beginning of re recorded time into your hands. You become a better person. You more easily become the person you want to become because of these courses. Because your survival, the survival of your soul, depends on your becoming a fully engaged human being. There's a whole lot more to say about Professor Stefaniak's funny, touching, insightful, and thought-provoking book, and there's not enough time to say it. So let's hear from the author herself. I'm very proud and honored to be able to present to you my colleague and my good friend, Mary Helen Stefaniak. Thank you, Brent, for that wonderful introduction and for telling a lot about the book so that I don't have to summarize it in any way. That's always a, a, a blessing. I also would like to thank um, uh, Professor Ha for 
um, this very good idea she had um, a while back of, about using the keywords in Baghdad, Georgia, uh, in World Lit. And I'd like to thank, to the um, English department and the College of Arts and Sciences and uh, the World Lit instructors who have you know, spent time in their classrooms on my book. And also, of course, not last but not least, all of you students who um, have read the book or will read it or might read it soon, and everyone else who's here. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Um, it's a good thing that um, uh, um, Brent didn't, you know, quote praise for the book and things like that, because I worked some of that right into this talk, so it would have been kind of, kind of redundant. I, um, uh, you'll see in a minute what I mean, but um, I wanted to, in conceiving this, I thought that what I'd like to do is share with you um, what the process of researching a novel like The Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia, in other words, a novel that draws heavily on other places and times, on uh, not only Georgia in 1938-39, when most of the story takes place, but also, um, as those of you uh, who have read the book know, um, it takes us to the Arabian Peninsula during the um, uh, First World War. It takes us to uh, Georgia and with uh, General Sherman in 1864. Uh, marching to the sea, it takes us to, uh, ultimately it takes us to, it, it takes us on a journey across Africa in the 18th century with a, um, a young West African Muslim and his father performing the Hajj, uh, going all the way from uh, almost the West African coast, from Kuta Jalun all the way to Mecca, a distance of over 3,000 miles. And it also takes us to Baghdad. Uh, in a couple of different eras, but the longest to go era that it takes us to is 8th century Baghdad, and that's as far back as it can go because that's when Baghdad was founded. So it, it really covers a lot of territory. It spends most of its time in 1938. Oh, sure. can't hear me? Yep. Is it hidden? What's wrong? What's wrong? Everybody heard that? Is that better? Is that better? Can you hear me? I can, is, that, is, it, is that good up there in the back? Louder. Maybe it's too far from me. Well, I'm going to keep talking anyway. I'll talk loud. Um, and uh, they can make adjustments as we go. Uh, so anyway, I thought I would share with you the kind of research that I did and also read you a few passages from the book that will um, uh, kind of show you how that research is transformed into the stuff of fiction, uh, which is a particular, um, well, now I'm on both of them. Is that all right? Should I turn the other one off? All right. Good. Good. I was lumping up my sweater here. OK, although then I have to hide behind here, but that's all right, I guess. What are you going to do? Um, all right, so, uh, and it, uh, that's, so that's my plan. So here's how I start. Now this is what I mean by offering a little praise that uh, Brent was uh, left out of, of, of his introduction. Um, this particular comment by Judith Kitchen, for one thing, summarizes the book uh, for, or says something about the book for those of you maybe who haven't read it yet. Uh, but it also uh, says something about the book that I had in mind kind of from the start which is that it delves into the re nation's recent past in order to caution us about the imminent future. That uh, ultimately, I, I also want to read this because this, this comment, it wasn't, it was one of the um, comments that publishers, you know, they solicit uh, endorsements from other writers. They send writers your book. And Judith Kitchen is a novelist and a poet. And uh, they want the writer to write, say something wonderful about your book so that they can put it on the back, you know, and everybody calls those blurbs, right? Well, Susan Kitchen wrote this lovely blurb, and then it didn't end up on the book um, because, and I think one reason it didn't is that it was too uh, serious. I mean, it kind of took the book just a little bit too seriously. And uh, it, I, I think, um, I, which is saying nothing whatsoever against the, the writers who, who, whose blurbs do end up on the back of the book because um, uh, I'm grateful to all of them. But um, it's as though Judith Kitchen sort of knew uh, what, I, what I had in mind um, in that um, 
This is the only work of fiction I have ever written, I think, that began as an idea. Began, and it began simply with the idea uh, that I'd like to, I wanted to um, bring together a group of Americans, and it turns out to be these people in Three Step Georgia in 1938-39, and Baghdad, and with everything that Baghdad represents, and put them in a relationship that was different from the relationship um, that uh, I guess you could say that has been created in the last uh, in, in the last six or seven years since March 2003, which is when I first conceived of writing this book um, on the morning after the shock and awe bombing. And I thought um, of all the things that Baghdad and the broad swath of history and culture that Baghdad represents, all the things which we encounter from Gilgamesh on in, in World Lit One, starting back in World Lit One, all those things that seemed to me were uh, in danger of being lost sight of. I felt as though I was being robbed of something and it was being replaced by um, the difficulties of, of the present time. So that was you know, an idea I had. and. Um, and Judith Kitchen knew that, I guess. Now, a cheer, more cheerful way to think about the book is on this next slide, which is, a, it's a big-hearted story of a Depression-era town turned upside down by a worldly teacher. And those are the kinds of, you know, handles that help, help uh, um, uh, the kind of descriptions that help people get a handle on what the book is about. What, 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 or I should say, what happens in the book. Um, the, uh, obviously, a question that I can address in talking about this book is one that E.L. Doctorow is asked all the time, because his novels are always set in some other place or time. Uh, and this, this is the cover of the march, which is um, about General Sherman's uh, march through Georgia to the sea. And when an interviewer asked him what's the difference between a historian writing history and a novelist, and I always want to finish that brushing her teeth, but I'm sure that's not what the rest of the question was. It was and a novelist writing a novel. And the difference is that he says that the historian will tell you what happened. The novelist will tell you what it felt like. And I think that's a good, uh, you know, it's a good distinction. It's a, it's a valid one. Um, of course, his, historians will actually tell you a version of what happened. Um, they can't tell you what happened even if they were there. But um, they will give you a version, and the novelist will be focused on telling you what it felt like to be there. Now this, uh, on, this <laughs> on this slide, you see what is my guiding principle in writing fiction that makes use of history, historical characters, historical events. This is from a very funny story by one of my favorite fiction writers, Donald Barthelme. And in it, one character is, reads a, a story to another character, and the, the listener says, is this historically accurate? Because it's set in the distant past. And the writer responds, it does not contradict what is known. And that's my principle of writing fiction that employ, of writing history in fiction, um, of imagining times um, from, from the past. And, uh, and that was the principle that guided me in writing the uh, Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia. And of course, that gives you a huge amount of territory um, to operate in, because in any historical event, most of what happened to people is not known. We only get the little tip of this part of the story and that part. Now, these are the kinds of sources to give you an idea of how you know you go about, or how I this novelist went about writing this book. These are the kinds of sources I use that help me tell you what it felt like to be part of this depression era town in Georgia. And news, I can't overemphasize how important newspapers of the time are. As I'm sure many of you know, I think there are you can see a lot of um, writers in the audience, and you know that. Um, when you want to write a poem or a story, again, that is set not necessarily in a different time, but maybe a place where you've never been or where you haven't been much, or even um, it's a, a story or a poem that's about a pro that in, in entails a process or a, an occupation or something that you know you don't know firsthand. Um, uh, the, these kinds of uh, you, you have to end up doing a lot of research. And if the story is set in a different place and time, uh, and you can look at the newspapers of the day, they are your number one source of the feeling of the time, of everything from the feeling, the atmosphere, how people really felt. For example, about entering World War One. You know, how did Americans feel about entering World War One when Woodrow Wilson was trying to uh, kind of talk talk them into it? 
um, we get a whole different version after the fact than um, you get from reading newspapers of the time. Uh, another books that are written, again, that are contemporary with uh, the time that you're, you're writing about, and I'm going to talk about several of, of those as we go on here. For me, because the Georgians, the Georgia part of uh, Baghdad, the caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia, and for that matter, the caliphs are uh, drawn from my mother's uh, family history. Uh, or I shouldn't say my family, from my mother's relatives, which are my relatives too. Uh, and other oral sources like interviews and, and eavesdropping, which is an another tool not to be, can't be overemphasized. Um, vintage photographs, and I'm going to show you some of those. Travel, uh, you know, you can do a lot of inter, uh, research, no matter what uh, kind of uh, information you need, on the internet, and certainly I learned some things. I learned, uh, you know, like what a 17th, no, an 18th century Red Sea pirate ship would look like, which I needed to know. Uh, and I, I found that out on the internet, and that was very useful. Um, but you can't learn, uh, and you probably can learn everything on the internet, but you can't learn it with the kind of felt experience that you might need in order to make people know what this time and place really felt like. Uh, and so I have a couple of examples of that. And travel can also lead you to artifacts like uh, a real 1929 Model A truck as opposed to pictures that you found on the internet, some of which I will share with you. Now I'm going to start with some vintage photographs and kind of work them together with family stories. And some of these are just in here because I think you'll like seeing them, I guess, is the reason that they're in the show, uh, in the slide presentation, I should say. Um, my mother is from Georgia, as I've already told you. Now that's a picture, in that picture my mom is sitting in her mother's lap and her sisters, Dottie, Mimi, and Sissy. Sissy is the one over on the right, the tallest, the tallest one. Um, uh, standing beside them about in about 1927. Now when you see that family, if you've read the, um, the Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia, it might make you think of May Caliph and her, we're always hearing about May and her girls who are wearing the same kind of sweater she is and so forth. And indeed, my mother's mother um, was, for me in many ways, uh, a model for, for May even though the details of their lives, uh, you know, in some places they converge and things that happen to um, May happened because they were things that um, I thought of because they had happened to my grandmother. Then there are many other sorts of things about the circumstances and events of May's life that did not happen to my grandmother because I'm writing fiction. And then this is why I'm not from Georgia. I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, my father was stationed at Robbins Field uh, near Macon during World War II and met my mother there. So I grew up in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now this is just to show you that my mother, my mother and I still go to Georgia. <laughs> and there we are on my Aunt Sissy's uh, back porch in Haddock, Georgia a couple of years ago. I don't know why I look like a, a being from a different, larger universe than they do. I must be some kind of trick of perspective. Of perspective. But that's Aunt Sissy in the middle and uh, my mother on the right standing farthest. Uh, this is a picture, as it says, of my mom at age 11. I very much wanted to have this picture on the cover of the book for a long time because for me, this is what Gladys Califf looks like. But you can, as it says, you can picture her any way you like. And one reason you can do that is that I think I'm correct, although it's always dangerous to make statements about a book that you wrote because it's, you haven't necessarily read it in the last few days. But I don't think that there is a single word of physical description about Gladys Califf, who's the narrator. She's 11 years old in 1938-39. And um, I just, I don't think there is a single word of description about her. Uh, there are a lot of characters in the book that, um, for, which, for whom or about whom there is no physical description. Then there are other characters where the physical description is important, like we learn about how good looking Force is, and we learn about uh, Gladys's older brother Force, and we learn that how much he looks like his sister, her, his sister May, which is important. So when appearance is important, we learn that. Uh, Eugene Boykin is very, very tall, taller than anybody else, even though he's, he's the younger brother um, of Theo Boykin. So when appearance plays a role in the story, it's there. Otherwise, it's not. So um, I'm not saying that that's a principle that everyone should follow, but I, I was particularly gratifying for me when um, uh, people res respond to the book, because uh, one thing about you know, email and websites, you get a lot of response to your personal messages, like you got, which I guess comes under the category of fan mail. And then there's also the non-fan mail. But in any case, you do get some fan mail. And um, 
uh, people always say how they feel like they really got to, they know these characters. These characters were so vivid and real to them. And so maybe it's a, um, a, a point worth mentioning that they were, they are made real to the extent that they are for individual readers with the participation of the reader's imagination and, and imagining what they look like, because I don't tell you. And it wasn't because I was thinking, who'd play her in the movie? Didn't want to cut anybody out. That's not what I said. Anyway, I really wanted to put my mother on the cover, so then that would have been a statement. And I think that the, and, and the, the reason, well, never mind, it doesn't matter about the reason why um, uh, she's not on the cover, but it wasn't anything to do with what I just said. And this is in here just because I want you to see my mom's graduation picture. Her name is Mary Helen, like mine. Uh, I'm named after my mother. Um, she graduated from Peabody High School in Milledgeville, Georgia in 1943. And um, for those of you uh, for whom Flannery O'Connor is a familiar name, that author Flannery O'Connor graduated from Peabody High School in Milledgeville, Georgia in 1942. So my mother, um, uh, my mother and Flannery O'Connor occupied the same space uh, in time on that high school. I, uh, at, at that high school, my mother knew who Flannery O'Connor was. She was the Catholic girl. And I could talk about that more, but I'm not going to. Uh, some of the uh, characters in my novel are inspired by other members of my uh, mother's family. The one on the left here, Aline, is, um, although she's wearing a dress, is uh, a character on whom Ildred Caliph is uh, um, modeled um, in some ways. One of the most, maybe the most conspicuous way is that um, Aunt Aline had one short arm, and it's actually her left arm, which she is discreetly hidden behind uh, her sister Gladys in, in the photograph. But my great Aunt Aline, you know, whom I, who's since, who's de deceased now, but whom I knew quite well, uh, is a person who really said that the only thing I can't do with only one hand no, with only one arm, is clap my hands. Um, and that's the kind of sentence, especially if the person uttering it doesn't mess it up by saying hand too soon. But in any case, that's the kind of uh, uh, sentence that really defines a person. And so that sentence spoken by my great aunt Aline became the character of Mildred, I mean not Mildred, Ildred, um, in the novel. This is a picture of my great uncle Elmo Caliph, and um, uh, who is in fact the, the brother of these other people you've seen so far, all of my, my grandmother's siblings, these would be, uh, my great aunts and uncles. And he was a, um, a, a dead ringer for our actor Tyrone Power Jr. I don't, Elmo died before I was really aware of who he was. Uh, so even though we visited Georgia um, uh, every year, that was, I didn't know you could go to, on vacation anyone anywhere else, as I've mentioned before. Um, but uh, Elmo is the uh, model for Force Caliph. And in case you don't know who Tyrone Power Jr. is, here's a publicity shot <laughs> of Tyrone Power Jr., who was a, a, a popular actor of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And those are movies worth checking out, especially Suez. He plays Ferdinand de Lesseps, architect of the Suez Canal. Uh, now this is not, um, uh, this is another vintage photograph, not from my family's photo album, but from um, a book that I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, later uh, by, uh, called Drums and Shadows, which is one of those old books, a book contemporary with the time. And this book was, uh, um, well, I'll tell you about it later when I get to it. But anyway, this, this picture, so, so my vintage photographs weren't always people I know. I mean, you can be inspired to a character, you really see the boy's, uh, pensiveness, and I think in his intelligence, uh, you know, in his face and the, 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 the way he's holding that, um, whatever it is there, he's holding a stick or a paddle, uh, he, um, that's how I picture Theo Boykin. But once again, if you read the book, you can picture Theo Boykin, you know, in particular, any way you like. You just have to picture his brother as very, very tall. Uh, and this is a picture of my great-grandmother, Daisy Caliph, who, who keeps her name in the book, although I spell it differently. And um, I never knew my grandmother, Maddie, who uh, you saw that picture of my mother in her mother's lap at the beginning, because Maddie, my grandmother Maddie, dialed in, died in childbirth when my mother was 11 years old. But I did indeed know um, my great-grandmother, Daisy, whom I met many, many times on childhood uh, trips to Georgia. And I, I mention her name, Caliph, 
um, I, I'm not sure why I spelled it differently. I think I wanted to make sure people would say caliph instead of caliph was part of it. And maybe I also thought that if anybody in my family really hated it, they wouldn't sue me because I'd say, oh, oh, no, no, a different family. Uh, but in any case, um, my, uh, both of those names are pronounced the same as at least one pronunciation of the word caliph, which again, as you read the book and you go all the way back to 9th century Baghdad and you inhabit some of the Arabian Nights, that, that, that title becomes um, an important one. And that, uh, this actually is a, a, a line that Gladys Caliph spoke that got cut from the novel. She defines caliph as the ruler of old time Baghdad, also known as the commander of the faithful and the slave of God and a pile of other titles and names I won't go into right now. So you are the only people, you and everybody else I show this slideshow to, are the only people who get to read that line that got cut from the novel. Now, um, we're kind of moving into old books, and this is, this is a very old book from, uh, I mean, obviously the, the, the Arabian Nights' is, uh, stories are even older, and I'm not going to talk about the fact that they're mostly Persian tales and not Arab uh, Arabian at all. But um, uh, this book, the Book of the Thousand Nights, well, let me read the whole title page. A plain and literal translation of the Arabian Nights' entertainments, now entitled The Book of the Thousand Nights and a Night, because presumably that's a more accurate translation of the Arabic order of words, I guess. With introduction, explanatory notes on the manners and customs of Muslim men, and a terminal essay upon the history of the Knights. And this is just volume one, and it's written and translated by Sir Richard F. Burton, and there should be many novels written about that man, printed by the Burton Club for private subscribers only, and all ten volumes of it were sitting on the shelf in the Reiner uh, Library. So um, I went from reading the newspaper about the shock and awe bomb bombing to the uh, mm, electronic card catalog and uh, looked up Baghdad and went to that call number and these books were on that uh, shelf. And they're such, so, so striking, these big green, very pale green books with gold lettering on the spine that they also become an object in the book, as you know, uh, in the novel, um, Miss Spivey sends for these books in order to read to the children uh, from them. This is another book that um, I found on the shelves in the Reiner Library, The Camel Bells of Baghdad, written by um, uh, Janet Miller, who, uh, and published in 1934. And the book was sitting there on the shelf in Reiner. And I don't know if that shows that, you know, there are books that ought to have been cleaned out, but I'll tell you, I'm glad they weren't. Uh, because there were some wonderful books uh, that I found um, that have not been reprinted. Sometimes, you know, you can find an old book and it's been reprinted, or you can, or you can find it in special collections. This book, I then went to the internet and bought my own copy, you know, found a copy of it. Um, this was such an important uh, book for me, not only because it was full of wonderful information about Baghdad, where um, Janet Miller traveled, the real Janet Miller traveled in uh, the late 1920s, around 1930. Um, but also because Janet Miller, the real person, was, as I say there, I mean, a woman in the 1920s, 1930s, um, a doctor without borders, traveled all around the world, and she was from Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm looking for connections for this far-fetched idea of bringing together my Georgia relatives that I know so well and Baghdad. So this was a wonderful, um, even more than the Arabian Nights stories, which was another thing, of course, that I thought of. Um, she, uh, she's from Nashville, Tennessee, and Tennessee is only one state north of Georgia, so there you go. Another very interesting thing about this book is that yesterday, talk about getting emails from fans, I received an email, the subject line of which was, Janet Miller is my great, great aunt. And so it was a, a message from, and of course I opened it with some trepidation since I've turned her into, her, her into a, a, a fictional character. Again, I do not contradict what is known about her. There's no reason why she couldn't have taken a trip like this with Miss Spivey or without her, right? Um, but um, uh, in a sense, I invent some fictional, I imagine some other detours, some other things that Janet Miller might have done. So anyway, I opened it with some trepidation, but found that um, her great-grandniece, or whatever you would call that relation, uh, was delighted with the book and was so pleased to see Jan her, her great-great-aunt as a character in the book, she thanked me for giving Janet Miller another shot at fame. And uh, because actually in her time, there was a committee that wanted to nominate her for a Nobel 
prize and she never got it and she sort of disappeared. I could find nothing about her, nothing. Um, and so uh, it was wonderful to hear from her great grand niece. And I just mentioned these two books, the one called A Baghdad Chronicle, which was published in 1929 originally, but was republished in 1977, and Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence, um, also known as Lawrence of Arabia, uh, which was republished in 1991, but originally published in 26. So sometimes you have to look to see, you can, you can find these books and they look like newer books, but you can see that it's not a, a perspective. Often there's an introduction that tells you something about it. And I mentioned these books because these are books uh, um, from which I learned a lot about the Middle East during the world, during, before and during World War I, which is the time when the modern state of Iraq was created. Uh, so um, the modern state of Iraq. And, uh, um, so I just mentioned those as two more old books, and I have a couple others. But now I'm going to move on to artifacts. So I've talked about uh, vintage photographs as being a source of kind of character and inspiration and information, how people dressed, for example. Um, and then I also mentioned old books and artifacts. And I, while well, I've got two pictures of, this is a, a model, uh, it's a 1929 Model A Ford um, a truck of the sort that the caliphs in the book um, own. And uh, here's another one that looked more like the ones that, <laughs> that uh, um, I, the one that I found for sale in Michigan looked a little bit more like this one, although it did have all its parts. Uh, and I can't emphasize enough, th this is like a wonderful example of how important travel or at least, you know, leaving the desk and going somewhere to find some actual stuff that you might interact with in order to write um, a story, whether a contemporary one or one from the past, uh, that sitting in this truck was, um, not this truck, I had, it was a different one, but sitting in a truck like this, realizing how small the ca and kind of cave-like the cab was and what it must have been like to be Gladys Caliph, 11-year-old Gladys Caliph, sandwiched between her 17, extremely handsome 17-year-old brother at the wheel and on the other side of her, the young school teacher who's got a big crush on her brother and vice versa. So anyway, I knew what that would be like from, uh, uh, seeing that truck firsthand. And actually, I'm going to, I think this is a place when I would like to stop. Let's make sure. Oh, no, I think I'm going to go a little bit further. One more artifact. And one more kind of uh, testimonial to artifacts and travel. And this was a sign I came across while driving through Georgia, not on one of those childhood trips, but much more recently when I made deliberate uh, when I kind of combined family trips with deliberate research. And I, you came to this town and said, welcome to Deep Step, KLN capital of the world. And aside from Deep Step similarity to Three Step, which we've all noticed, um, I thought, when I saw that sign, I thought, KLN, what is that? And I turned to my cousin Royce Caliph and I said, Kaelin, what is that? And he explained what it was, and that the Kaelin is this white dirt, this kind of, uh, it's a mineral that's very, very important to the economy of the seven um, uh, counties, of which my fictional county of Piedmont uh, is one. So then I looked into Kaelin, and I toured a mine, not this one, as it says, and I'm sorry, this is not the greatest picture, but there, it's open pit mining, and in spite of the fact that the there are mines like this all over middle Georgia, where my mother was from. I had never heard about it before, and she didn't know what it was either. Now, some of my younger cousins, like the ones my age, um, they uh, said, oh, yeah, yeah, the kaolin plant in, although they say the kaolin plant in uh, McIntyre. When I was a kid and going to school, all the trees along from, from uh, uh, Deep step to McIntyre, all year they'd be frosted white. They looked like it was snowing because there wasn't a lot of EPA action happening when they were mining this stuff to begin with. They're more responsible about it now. But in any case, Kaolin is very important to the plot of the book, not only because it allows them to transform the town physically, because they got this huge supply of stuff they make into white paint of sorts, but also because um, uh, uh, it's a source of conflict between um, uh, Mr. Gordon, the town lawyer and clan leader, and the Boykin family, whose uh, farm is uh, sitting on top of a very rich, pure 
um, mine of this. But uh, so that there's some information about. And I also then so then of course I looked Kaylin up, and I found that all of these very interesting facts about Kaylin that I'll leave you um, to read for yourself. Um, I think it's especially interesting that there is no kaolin in kaopectate, but there used to be. Uh, because in fact, people, well, you'll see why that's a particular, well, I guess if you've read the book, you already know. But what I'd like to do is read you a little scene in which um, uh, none of these facts are found in the novel, precisely because they're not, they're, they're wonderfully uh, interesting information, but they're not part of the world um, of the story. And so I thought I would read you uh, the scene in which Miss Spivey discovers um, kaolin. And uh, so I read this little excerpt. Okay. They're in the truck. You already know what the truck looks like, so they're in the truck. Miss Spivey turned to my brother Force on the way out to McIntyre on Saturday and asked him out of the blue, may I drive? It was easy for Force to pretend he hadn't heard her in Daddy's rattle trap of a truck, but I saw the muscle twitch in his jaw, and so did Miss Spivey. She asked again. Force gripped the wheel. This old truck, she's kind of a tricky lady, he said. This old truck is a truck, said Miss Spivey. She had been looking out the window at the pine trees flicking past like big green brushes, but now she looked at him again. I was entirely invisible on the front seat between them. The clutch sticks some, he said. I once drove from New York City to Denver, Colorado, Miss Spivey said, on the Lincoln Highway. Now Force took his foot off the gas, pushed in the clutch, and turned to look at her to see if he'd heard her right, I expect. She gave him a big smile, and instead of going around the next sharp curve in the road, he drove Daddy's Model A truck straight into a ditch. He yelled, damn, and Miss Spivey said, oh, and there we were, each of us with our arms out straight and hands on the dash to keep from pitching forward into the windshield. We had a fine view of the ditch the truck was aimed down into, along with the underside of a huge sweet gum tree that was already uprooted at the edge of the ditch. Around the roots of the sweet gum, the exposed dirt was white as snow, and bluish white water that looked like dirty milk filled the crater the roots had left when the tree fell. What is that? Miss Spivey bent her elbows to get closer to the windshield. Is it snow? She asked, causing me to think that her brain was addled by the accident. Temporarily, I hoped. No, it ain't snow, said Force. He didn't sound addled at all. He craned his head around, trying to see out the back window. Are they all right back there? He meant Theo Boykin and Miss Templeton in the back of the truck. Miss Spivey opened the passenger side door. It looks like snow, she was saying as she stepped down. Her hiking boots looked newly clean, the brown leather gleaming. So I said, best not step in that white dirt, Miss Spivey. She stopped and turned to look at me. White dirt, she said. I think I'm going to stop there in that scene. Although it does end with uh, Theo tell, explaining to Miss Spivey after he's told her what the white dirt consists of, it's aluminum silicate. It does end with him... Uh, telling her that some folks like to eat it. And uh, she says, they eat it, and brings the white end of the stick uh, that she dipped into the ditch closer to her face as if she might try a lick. Because the fact is, people did eat it, and for, you know, for indigestion. And also maybe just because they like to eat it. So that gives you an idea of how facts about kaol kaolin, um, uh, while they might be interesting, um, are not necessarily uh, destined to wind up in the, in the fictional s scene. Now, this is another part of the research that I need to um, uh, um, acquaint you with, and this involves travel. I'd already been working on the book for um, uh, at least three years at this point, and Miss Spivey was a reality, and she was reading the Arabian Nights to the, the kids in, in school, and um, uh, lots of other things were going on. Uh, when I decided I needed a coastal island for purposes of the plot um, in the book. And uh, so I went to Sapelo. I went to Skidaway Island and to Sapelo Island, where I'd never been, because all I ever did in Georgia was visit the relatives. And they're in the middle of Georgia. I had no idea what was anywhere else. And I'm going to show you on a map um, where Sapelo Island is, although I don't have, oh, I bet I do. Is this a pointer? It's supposed to be a pointer, isn't it? Oh, well. Oh, use the mouse. 
oh, you know, never mind. See those islands over there on the right? <laughs> that, that's the part of Georgia that's um, on the Atlantic uh, Ocean. And actually, there's kind of a big one, the biggest one right in the middle, that's Sapelo Island. Um, uh, and I think you can see that. It's right, uh, right next to the O in Ocean on, on the map. And that map is from another old book that was very useful, the WPA Guide to Georgia's Towns and Countryside. Those kinds of guides were written for many states um, during the Depression when uh, um, Franklin D. Roosevelt's stimulus package <laughs> and job programs created the WPA, which um, also, of course, is paying Miss Spivey's salary um, uh, in the novel. So. It was nice to, so then I had a, a, a map of what was there and what wasn't in 1939, 1940. But to get back to Sapelo Island, this is uh, the author standing in front of uh, Sapelo Island Mansion owned by R.J. Reynolds Jr. of the tobacco company. He bought all of Sapelo Island in 1934. That uh, mansion, which is an odd looking one, right? It's kind of squat. It's not how you picture a southern plantation mansion, even though it does have uh, pillars. It's built squat for a reason uh, because uh, hurricanes wash over these islands. And this is uh, um, the kind of structure, although this is not the original mansion, the original mansion did weather um, more than one uh, hurricane. Um, and uh, on this uh, uh, island, much of which was one big plantation at the time of the Civil War, belonged to a man named Thomas Spaulding. You can see the ruins of slave cabins here. Um, and that tabby is a building material originally from, or that uh, enslaved individuals brought the recipe with them from Africa. It's a building material made of sand, uh, shells, and limestone. And you'll see more of it here. You can see the white stuff in the wall there. Those are the, the little broken seashells. So this is a tabby wall on Sapelo Island. Wait. Oh, yeah. I'm going back. Let's see. Okay. But the most amazing discovery I made on Sapelo Island is in the next slide. So that's why I had to be very careful about not going to the next slide. Um, and it was made in the visitor center after we took the tour on the Bluebird bus and we had uh, it was a great tour, and I recommended you take a ferry out to the island and then you take a tour with a park ranger because you, you can't go out to Sapelo Island unless you have business there. Now, I know that um, the biology department here, Dr. Shallis in the um, biology department here at Creighton does, is very, very familiar with Sapelo Island because he does work, I think, many summers, maybe every summer, um, at the Georgia Marine Institute there. And there's also a nature preserve and all of, uh, and there's also a town called Hog Hammock. There used to be six little towns, but now there's only one town called Hog Hammock. And the residents of that town are, many of them, descendants of the slaves that worked that last plantation um, that was there uh, at the time of the Civil War. And uh, so after we um, uh, went and looked, you know, took the tour, we were in the visitor's center looking at the historical displays when in one of those historical displays, and this is only a photograph, so it's not going to be as dramatic for you, I came across this little notebook, a facsimile of a little notebook. And that notebook, remember, I'm trying to write a novel in which I'm connecting Baghdad in 1938 with, I mean, Georgia in 1938 with Baghdad, and really all the way back to, as you'll see, 9th century Baghdad is where I wanted to be headed. Um, and this notebook belonged to Bilali Mahomet. Uh, it is written in Arabic script. Uh, he was a Muslim from West Africa who was a slave on Sapelo from 1802 until 1859. He was a very, very intelligent man who pretty much, who was the slave overseer on the island. Um, and um, I suspect, and if I were to have written more about Thomas Spaulding, the owner of the plantation, who was a young man when he bought Balali in the Bahamas from another plantation owner, and Balali was in his 40s by then, when young Thomas Spaulding bought Balali Mahomet uh, for his knowledge of growing Sea Island cotton and indigo and sugar and other things that Thomas Spaulding wanted to grow on his Sapelo Island plantation. Um, it is my belief that many of the papers that Thomas Spaulding wrote for the Agricultural Society about the various things he'd invented to um, process the sugar or uh, in other, other kinds of yet a very elaborate um, sort of sugar mill that he invented, 
I personally believe that Bilali Mohammed was probably behind most of the innovative ideas and things that, that, that Thomas Balding came up with. It just makes sense. I should mention that Bilali Mohammed was purchased, um, he, uh, as I said, he was in his 40s, but he had been uh, kidnapped and taken as a slave. Probably he was a prisoner, uh, uh, an exchange of prisoners in a war when he was a teenager in West Africa. And he first um, went to uh, the, the Caribbean, and it was in, in the Bahamas, and lived there uh, until he was um, a middle-aged man at the time he was purchased and brought to Georgia. And he was all purchased along with, he was a, you know, an important, uh, you know, buy, in that his, uh, he was purchased along with his wife and uh, seven daughters, who were mostly grown uh, up, like teenagers and older, although depending on what source you read, he was purchased with his two wives and his six daughters. But there's, one source is not any more definitive than the other, and all of the sources are rather few. Um, so obviously, I had to go back and retool my story and make a big, big place for Bilali Mohammed, who somehow or another needed to be the ancestor, whether biologically or just culturally, of Theo Boykin, the chief engine, the 17-year-old African-American who's kind of the genius of the Baghdad Bazaar, because he was already that in my story when I came across this notebook and learned of the existence of Bilali Mohammed. Um, so, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm speechless again, as I was speechless then when I discovered this. Um, I'm, and I'm going to read you, I think at this point, let's see. Yeah, well I could tell you this um, as well, that um, uh, the, the picture of the young man that I picture, is, is kind of how I picture Theo Boykin in my mind, is from this book, Drums and Shadows, uh, Survival Studies Among the Georgia Coastal Negroes, which was, again, a WPA, a, a Federal Writers Project um, publication. They sent uh, oral historians and journalists to interview uh, the uh, people on the coastal islands of Georgia, and includes interviews and photographs, the two photographers, uh, Muriel and Malcolm Bell, um, uh, Muriel is still alive, uh, Malcolm's deceased. They um, uh, take, took all these wonderful pictures of which my Theo Boykin, you know, is one. And actually that's, I, that's the, one of the only two pictures in the book that don't have the name of the person uh, with the photograph. So all of the photos are identified because they're usually pictures of people who were interviewed. And among those people is this woman, Katie Brown, who's the great granddaughter of Bilali Mahomet, and who remembers um, uh, not him, but her grandmother's stories about him. Uh, and then there are others, because uh, her mother, her grandmother was Margaret. Um, uh, his daughter Margaret, but there are other pe families uh, in Hog Hammock, and then also families that have scattered elsewhere, who uh, were um, uh, relatives of, or descendants of different ones of those seven daughters, only one of whom is buried um, on the island. Um, let me just look at my notes for a minute to see what I want, if I want to... Hmm. Okay, I'll just tell you real quickly. Um, these are just a couple of books about Sapelo Island, if you're interested in it. This one by a historian, published by W.W. W. Norton and Company, who also published The Caliphs of Baghdad, Georgia. And then this book by Cornelia Walker Bailey, who is in fact a Sapelo Island resident today and a descendant of, of Balali. And much of the book is about her struggle to save Hog Hammock, but there's lots of interesting information. And she too didn't know who Balali was. Uh, as a child growing up. It wasn't until she started asking questions of her relatives that she found out um, that he was a Muslim, and a literate Muslim, and perhaps in training to be an imam at the time that he was um, kidnapped. Uh, but I also learned, so I read on in that direction, that Bilali Mahomet was one of many, many African Muslims enslaved in the Americas, some literate and some not. Uh, and this is a very interesting book um, about which uh, uh, has uh, sort of um, thumbnail biographies of many people. And this is just a list of like one sentence biographies of several uh, of the uh, African Muslims that were enslaved in the Americas. All of them, of course, before the um, uh, Civil War. Uh, and what happened in the Civil War was that a lot of the uh, records of, of 
these people because they were interesting, you know, because some of them could, uh, for example, the, the um, Omar Ibn Sa Said, when he ran away from the plantation where he was enslaved in, South, Carol in uh, South Carolina, and they stuck him in a jail cell, he found a piece of coal and he wrote on all the walls and the, filled the whole jail, jail cell with writing in Arabic explaining why they should let him go, hoping that there was someone around sufficiently civilized to read it. But there wasn't. So, and then this, and uh, Lamine Kebe is another, um, uh, he was a teacher. He was on a paper buying mission for his school when he was um, captured and uh, um, again also in a, in a battle. There was a lot of inter, um, uh, uh, community and tribal and, uh, fighting going on at that time in West Africa. But also, you know, and then, then these prisoners of war could be sold to the white slavers who had their factories, and that's what they called the, um, um, the big places where they, big buildings, buildings, that, and one of them is actually a huge castle, uh, where they processed um, the, the slaves and sent them out to the ships. Uh, and um, uh, so, these slaves, prisoners of war, would be sold to those factories. They called them factories because the salespeople, the, the merchants, the traders and slaves, as in many kinds of goods, are called factors, which is a word you might have seen in, your, in a world lit um, text. But he was on, you know, buying paper when he was kidnapped, disappeared, 30 years of slavery in the South. And he actually ended up getting back to Africa because often people who were well educated, um, like Omar ibn Said, people who could read and write, um, made, uh, they became little celebrities, you know, and they would write out the Lord's Prayer, you know, in the, in the parlor in, in Arabic, and everyone would think that was really cool until maybe they found out it wasn't the Lord's Prayer. But for the most part, um, you know, they, they, they did a lot of that kind of thing, and they would did cir uh, speaking, uh, speaker tours, and, and uh, usually they would have to uh, um, claim that they had converted to Christianity, and then they would get sent on, on speaking tours around the country. But a lot of that information kind of disappeared in the chaos that followed the Civil War, because this would all have been information, and uh, a lot of it would have been information that was in the hands of, um, of you know, white people, white uh, property owners in, in the South uh, at that time. So um, I think I'll leave that there for you for a moment. And, well, I think I'm going to go back to the notebook. No, well, I guess I should show you this, too, from another book. This is just a map. This is a map that shows you where some of the, um, uh, where various African Muslims whose stories are told in the book, uh, where they were, they came from. And uh, Balali Mahomet is, uh, was from Futa Jalon, which is, this is very untech, I know. He was a student in the town of Timbo, which is right there on the map. It's kind of, you can see it in that space. Um, uh, so that's where, that's where Bilali Mahomet was from. Now I'm going to go back to the uh, um, notebook because this is another, uh, you know, a picture of the notebook. And I did, in fact, get to hold and turn the pages of Bilali's actual notebook um, in the University of Georgia Library Special Collections. Uh, they didn't even make me wear gloves, which I thought was... Unless they shouldn't be doing that, or maybe not many that people have asked to look for it. There have been some attempts, there have been lots of attempts to translate, none of them entirely successful. Early on, um, a linguist named Joseph Green actually took the notebook to um, people in West Africa, and uh, the imams that he showed it to said, we think this is the work of a jinn which is an, an evil spirit, right? Because it didn't make sense, it was so mixed up. Well, this is actually something that um, Bilali wrote um, probably when he was older, as opposed to something that he wrote early on. Um, but the main source of confusion was that the script is Arabic, but the language is mostly Pular. Uh, the, his African language. And so, and then and he would kind of go back and forth. He'd have, uh, you know, things, um, prayers and legal treatise quotations from his schooling, which were in Arabic, in Arabic script. And then there'd be other stuff that no one uh, could figure out because it was in a different language. Just as, you know, you can use the Roman alphabet to write lots of different languages, right? Well, that's what he was doing. Um, but the question that the fiction write, writer asks herself is, 
who says Bilali only had one notebook? The reason we have this notebook in the library is that, and it's a 13-page little handmade thing, uh, is that this is what Bilali gave to a, uh, um, a white minister who was also an author, asking him to, you know, preserve it here, whatever. We don't know what he, he gave it to him. And um, then that notebook ended up in Francis Goulding's, Reverend Francis Goulding's papers and ultimately found its way to the library. And this is also a reason why it was hard to translate because it was so, uh, no one really asked anything about it at the time that it was, was given. Um, but, so that's why it's Bilali's notebook, singular. But who's to say? So I would like to read to you um, from a story that's very deep in the novel. Um, uh, because the novel does go back in time. And this is from a story uh, within the novel, not being told by Gladys. Uh, it's, the title of the tale is The Tale of the Veiled Lady with reference to a book written in the language of the prophet from which she carried pages in a bag around her neck. Or, and it also has the alternate title, The Tale of Where His Camels Came From. And uh, the Malcolm you'll hear about in this scene is the fictional great-grandson of Bilali and the grandson of Bilali's daughter, Margaret. It's 1864, and they are following General Sherman's army uh, back to the coast. So this is a little five-minute passage I'm going to read to you that will sort of show you, I don't know, also tell you a little bit about Bilali. Uh-oh. Oh, and then I do have to get... And I think I'm just going to get to one other little piece of research and one other excerpt to read. And we'll see if anybody is still here. <laughs> okay. By the second day of the final leg of the ever more populous march to the sea, Margaret wasn't feeling well at all. Um, she would be in her 80s at the time that she's making this trip. The helpful adjutant found a space for her in a covered wagon, and while she dozed fitfully in a makeshift bed, her grandson Malcolm held her hand, startled by its coolness. Earlier, she had felt hot to his touch. Gran, he said softly, are you cold? She turned her head on the straw pillow. Malcolm, I need your help, she said, and tugged at the colorful braid of cloth around her neck. What are you doing, Gran? He asked in alarm, I am removing this that I wear. Why? I do not wish to wear it any longer. Why not? Malcolm cried. It makes me itch right here. She touched a spot where the braid went around her neck. Oh, he said. Here, lift your head just right like that, there. When he had slipped the bag off her neck, he asked her where he should put it. Why? Around your own neck, Malcolm. I got to wear it now? For the time being, you do. But what if it makes me itch? Oh, it will. Relieved of her burden, Margaret closed her eyes, and within seconds, she was lightly snoring. Malcolm did not slip the cord over his neck, not yet. Instead, he scooted closer to the end of the wagon, where an opening in the canvas cover emitted a patch of sunlight. He gently pulled the bag open along its drawstring, and turning it upside down, he let the leather wallet inside the bag slide out into his lap. Malcolm knew that his great-grandfather, Bilali Mahomet, had made one such wallet for each of his daughters. Each wallet contained a different set of soft linen pages, like the ones that Malcolm laid out flat over his sunlit knees. Pages full of funny drawings of pitchers and lamps and strange creatures with water spouting from their mouths. Malcolm also knew, having heard, having many times heard the story that his great-grandfather, Bilali Mahomet, had copied these pages from an ancient book and then risked everything to bring them across deserts and oceans from his old life as a free Mohammedan, a life cut short in his youth. Even as a slave, first in the Bahamas and later on the island off the coast of Georgia, Malcolm's great-grandfather had been a figure of legend. What other slave overseer had ever been given arms to defend his master's land as Bilali was when English warships threatened the coast in 1812? 
And what other island plantation weathered the great hurricane of 1824 without the loss of a single life, Vallali having gathered people and cattle safely within the thick tabby walls? His cleverness was legendary too. People came to Sapelo from near and far to see the fountains whose water jets changed shape from lance to shield to lily by means of ingenious mechanisms Bilali had installed and to learn the methods he perfected for growing bumper crops of sea island cotton and sugar cane. An exacting taskmaster, aloof from and not altogether popular with his fellows, Bilali Mahomet practiced his religion and wrote an Arabic script and died a very old man in 1859 when his great-grandson Malcolm was four years old. Now, at nine, Malcolm was already long of limb, like Bilali, and his face was delicate and narrow, as dark and sweet as chocolate, which he had tasted once. He was said to resemble his mother, Esme, who waited for him in paradise. His grandmother told him long ago that a woman who died giving birth was like a soldier who gave his life in a holy war. Margaret did not add, although she believed it to be true, that her daughter's gift was the greater, as she had brought a new believer into the world. Malcolm couldn't picture his mother, no matter how hard he tried, but if he closed his eyes, he seemed to remember the long cloth coat that his great-grandfather famously wore and a round felt hat on the old man's head. In Malcolm's only memory of Bilali, the old man was talking with someone who looked like a pale wisp of smoke in a place that smelled of wood shavings and bristled with pipes. That was Reverend Goulding's carriage house in Darien, Margaret told Malcolm. She was surprised that he remembered it. They were always building something, she said. He was thick as molasses with that old preacher. Malcolm was right there in his grandmother's arms when Bilali gave the preacher that little book of his. I didn't want him to do it, Margaret said. It was a thin, hand-sewn notebook in which advice for growing long staple cotton shared the pages with lines that Bilali recalled from his student days so long ago, all of it written in ink concocted from the juice of pokeweed berries. The minister had accepted the little book graciously, although Margaret suspected even then that he believed the Arabic letters weren't letters at all, but only an imitation of words. Later, she asked her father why he had given his notebook to a man prevented by ignorance from reading a single word. Margaret had to smile when she told Malcolm her father's answer. I give it my daughter to show pig-eating Nazarenes that we are a people of learning. About the other book, the one Bilali had copied in his youth, the one whose remaining pages fluttered now on Malcolm's knees in the back of a covered wagon belonging to the victorious Federal Army of the United States of America. Of that one, Bilali had said to his daughter, this book of ancient learning is ours alone. So see, he had a whole bunch of notebooks. He gave pages to each of his daughter, to his daughters. Now the question that that perhaps raises is, what was the book? It's not the Quran. Um, uh, in part because we know Bilali was buried with his Quran, so that would contradict what was known. And it's also um, uh, a book that's full of pictures, uh, images, drawings, Malcolm said. Drawings of fountains and strange things, right? So what was that book? Well, that book was this book. And one of the pages that Malcolm is looking at, that Bilali copied, that Malcolm is looking at in that wagon is a page that looks like this. And it's kind of faint, I know, but that was the best I could get from the New York Public Library. You can't find this online. You have to go to the New York Public Library and they have to gi uh, give you permission to use one of their uh, slides. And then you have to figure out how to use this giant, giant, giant file. In a, in a format like this. But in any case, um, this is a page from the Book of Ingenious Devices, the Kitab al Hiyal, um, written by the Banu Musa, which means the sons of Musa bin Shakir. They're, and they were engineers and inventors who lived in 9th century Baghdad. So this is kind of the link that takes me back to 9th century Baghdad, to the years just following uh, the founding of Baghdad, only you know less than a century before. Um, 
This is also a device, this magic pitcher, that shows up looking more like an old tobacco can with Prince Albert's face near the handle of the pitcher um, uh, in Georgia in 1939 after Theo Boykin gets hold of a copy of this page, of Malcolm's copy of this page, and figures out uh, by looking at the diagram uh, how to make all the hidden chambers and things inside so as to make a ma magic picture of, of his own. Uh, and I'd like to read you just a little bit. Um, I thought about reading that the scene in which Theo Boykin in 1939 demonstrates the magic picture that looks like an old tobacco tin all hammered together, but it, you know, it's the inside that counts, um, uh, and demonstrates it by pouring her a glass of tea and then a glass of water from the same pitcher without you know, refilling it or clicking his heels or doing anything of that sort. Um, and of course, that's what the magic pitcher can do, which meant it could be put to nefarious uses um, if people didn't know why what was coming out of it was or wasn't coming out of it. Um, and that's what happens later in the book. But this um, a book of ingenious uh, devices is one that Balali's father, Balali Mahomet's father, a man whose name is entirely lost to history and whose circumstances would be entirely lost to history. And thus, I was free to uh, have the great pleasure of inventing some of Balali's youth before he was kidnapped and put on a slave ship and carried off. And what I invent for him, and what I'd like to read you, this is just a very short bit, is uh, a scene in which his father, um, whom I'm calling Ahmad Baba, um, goes to pick Balali up at school. The year is over, his year of school is over at Timbo, and his father goes to pick him up, and Balali thinks they're going home, but that's not where they're going. All right, so now we're in like the late 18th century West Africa. I got a picture of that other map, uh, the, the town of, of um, uh, Timbo. But you'll also hear a little bit about the Book of Ingenious Devices and why it's important to Bilali's father. Bilali's father had seen a copy of the Kitab al Hiyal, the famous book of ingenious devices, during his student days in Timbo, when a visitor from Baghdad came to work with scholars on deciphering the ancient script. He had never seen a picture in a book before. These were line drawings of things, like containers and lamps, fountains too with animal heads called idols by the scholars who studied the text. The pictures themselves suggested secret ingenious and perhaps forbidden powers hidden inside each device, sinuous tubes, curved handles, pitchers and pots with round bellies and narrow necks, and all manner of chambers and passages inside. The objects floated on the lines of script around them like vessels riding waves in the sea. When the visitor who brought the book from Baghdad spoke of the House of Wisdom, where the Banu Musa, had worked and studied and authored this book. Ahmad Baba didn't know if it was a place that still existed or one that had closed its doors in ages past. He knew only that he wished to go there, to stand where the sons of Musa had stood and hold in his hands the Kitab al Hiyal. how often he had done this in his dreams. This, his heart's desire, grew stronger as he watched his son Bilali grow, watched him put to use the powers of liquid and balance and timing and air, which Ahmad Baba could sense all around them. And Ahmad Baba is a metal worker, and he's kind of been in the business of making things that his son comes up with um, as, as, uh, thus far. If Bilali just once laid eyes on the book of ingenious devices, well, his father was, was uncertain exactly what would happen, but he was almost sure that God willed greatness for his son and that the key to that greatness could be found in the Kitab al Hiyal. Not even the wife of Ahmad Baba suggest, suspected that when the time came for him to add al Hajj to his name by making pilgrimage to the holy places, Ahmad Baba would carry with him his dream of setting foot in the house of wisdom with his talented son. That Baghdad lay perhaps another thousand miles beyond the holy places seemed a problem Ahmad Baba and his boy could solve when the time came. There was little they could not do if they put their minds and hands to it together. Two years, he thought, should suffice for the journey, both Hajj and house of wisdom included. Three at the most, God willing. 
I'm going to pause there just for a moment to say that the journey just from Timbo to uh, Mecca would have been a, a, a little over 3,000 miles. So, you know, another, it was actually another 900 miles to Baghdad. Eh. That's about as far as it is from Milwaukee to Macon, Georgia. So anyway, uh, Bilali, now a serious fellow of 14 years, greeted the news of a pilgrimage with guarded enthusiasm. His father had come to Timbo in an ox cart that was obviously loaded for a long journey. To show his father that he was neither a cowering child nor entirely ignorant of the world, he asked bravely, will we go to Shinkit and join the caravan to Cairo? Yes and no, said Ahmad Baba. Yes and no? We will go to Shinkit, his father said. Bilali waited. But we will not go to Cairo with the caravan, only to Rabat. From there, his father paused dramatically. We will go by sea. In a boat, Bilali said. His father laughed, unless you've learned to swim. So Bilali, of course, would never have seen a boat. Um, so that gives you an idea of how the Book of Ingenious Devices, which was an important thing to Bilali's father, somehow manages to find um, itself in copy in the hands of Theo Boykin so many years later, with Bilali the figure um, in between. And uh, in, uh, I'll show you this map, um, in the uh, novel, Bilali and his father, well, his father doesn't make the whole journey, as you know, if you've read the book, but um, Bilali follows the sea route of this 19th century uh, pilgrim to Mecca. And so this map is from a book called, as it says there, The Pilgrimage of Ahmad, Son of the Little Bird of Paradise, an account of a 19th century pilgrimage from, Mor pilgrimage from Mauritania to Mecca. And um, Bilali and his father would have been making this trip in the late 18th century. I think the trip would have been pretty similar to a 19th century uh, journey. Uh, I had you know, no idea, I'm not being a Middle Eastern scholar, I had no idea that I would find this. My first thought was, oh my gosh, how am I going to get him all the way from Timbo to uh, Mecca? Who's going to believe that? Well, it turns out that since the 13th century, West African Muslims have been making the journey from the vicinity of Timbo um, to, to Mecca. It takes them two or three years. Some of them make it and some of them don't. Uh, but in any case, this map shows you and what you would, if I were able to point with the mouse. We're almost at an end here. Let's see. Okay, I can. Look at that. Um, except that I can't see it clearly. In. Oh, yes, I can. All I have to do is look at the screen. Okay. Um, this is Shinkit, actually. You can probably see that. And Bilali and his father would have been starting from somewhere farther south here, where, where present-day Guinea is, is where they're from. And or, this uh, is Shinkit. And so um, they would take travel with a caravan overland to Rabat, which is like, oh, I can't quite see it, but oh, there it is, okay. That's Rabat, and that's where they get on a boat. Um, and then Bilali continues that journey by going through the um, Straits of Gibraltar. And the tar is the important part of that word. You'd never know it, but it means, uh, tar is, uh, what Gibraltar means is Tariq's mountain. So t the, the tar part of that word is the name of the guy that that rock is named after. And then they would go through the Mediterranean, and actually they would go through the Straits of Stromboli here, and they would go all the way to Suez, and Ferdinand de Lesseps not having been there yet, there is no Suez Canal, so they would have to go overland into the Red Sea. And that um, is why, and here's Mecca. You know, it's right there, it's across from my, it's in Arabia, um, with, where the little, uh, um, the guys, you can see where it is. I don't have to tell you. Anyway, um, that uh, um, is the journey that Bilali uh, ends up uh, making. And in order to continue by sea to Baghdad, which um, his father thinks they're going to do, all you would have to do is uh, continue through the Red Sea and go through the Gulf of Aden and come around here and go enter the Persian Gulf and go right up here and get on a camel at Basra and... Uh, take it uh, north to Baghdad, which is just right about there on the Tigris. So that is how Bilali ends up um, getting all the way to Baghdad and thus getting his hands on uh, 
uh, a copy of the Book of Ingenious Devices, um, which is used as bait, actually, to lure him and to kidnap him um, by uh, um, a trader that he's met on his journey, who knows how much he wants to see, you know, get his hands on this book. And um, let's see. I think that that's almost the last slide. Yep, because this is the last slide, and it takes us back to uh, Georgia. Um, and uh, you can see the, uh, the town of Baghdad, because the three-step becomes Baghdad, because the Baghdad Bazaar is so fabulously successful right there in uh, the middle of town. And um, let's see. I think that I probably had one more little thing I was going to share with you, but it's just, and it's just one paragraph, and this is a really good uh, way to end. So instead of my hemming and hawing and saying, are there any questions, this will be a decisive way to end. And it's from one of these stories in the, in, that are deep in the book that take, this one takes us all the way back to um, the founding of Baghdad. One paragraph. It's kind of a long paragraph, but it's one paragraph. In the second century of the Hydra, the year 762 by the Christian reckoning of our time. The Abbasid Caliph Abu Jafar al-Mansur drew with a stick on the ground beside the Tigris a great circle, one mile wide, enclosing a dusty village. The line the Caliph drew on the ground was covered with bales of cotton, hundreds of bales, or perhaps thousands, all soaked in naphtha and set afire. When the flames died, a charred outline remained on the ground, marking the shape of the new capital. Caliph al-Mansur placed his palace of the Golden Gate at the center of the round city, surrounded by a wall of immense thickness. Three horsemen could ride abreast along the top of this wall. Four great metal gates, so massive that a company of men was required to open or close each one, permitted entrance to the inner city. Date palm trees brought from Basra were planted everywhere until the new city had more palms than Basra and they yielded plentiful fruit. Watered by canals in use since Babylonian times, gardens and orchards and orchards and fields spread out around the new city, gardens and fields that would flourish for another 500 years until invading Mongols destroyed the ancient canals and returned the land to the desert. Caliph al-Mansur called his new capital Madinat al-Salam, the city of peace. The locals called it Baghdad. Thank you very much. <laughs> you. Well, we don't have too much. If there's some, anybody who has a question, if you would like, why don't you just uh, come on down and talk to me? Also, um, didn't you want to announce that um, I would sign books? Yeah, if anybody brought a book that they would like signed, I would be delighted to sign it for you. Thank, thanks.